The cooking in itself is, of course, rewarding, but it's it's really the experience when people get to eat the food and talk about the food and see the food for the first time. It's really that that's really what's my biggest reward, and that's also, of course, what's been desperately missing for the last two years at stages, especially the last few months. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Themed restaurants were very much a thing in the 80s and 90s in Australia. Often naff, kitsch, sometimes in tourist traps, but rarely a positive culinary journey. But as with everything in life, there are always anomalies. Inspiration for a venue can come from just about anywhere. And when someone manages to capture the essence of an idea and deliver above expectations, it becomes something quite special. Joachim Boranius is the head chef of Mjolnir in Sydney. Joachim, how are you? I'm well, thanks. You're the head chef of a Thor-inspired restaurant dishing up Viking feasts. That's something a little bit different. Yes, it most certainly is. But it's also, of course, very close to home, being born and bred in Sweden. It felt like a very natural fit when I first stumbled across the product. It's it's quite a... a interesting venue tell us about the concept and and the idea behind it all uh well the the uh speakeasy group which is the owners and creators of mjolnir uh are owned and run by sven roger almening who's a norwegian but also uh greg sanderson down who's based down in melbourne and uh the idea behind having a venue inspired by norse mythology and named after thor's hammer uh, was a way for, for for Sven to kind of grasp a hold of the mythology that comes around the the uh, the Norse mythology and and kind of put it into a venue that could escape time and place and just walk into a venue that just transcends you into a completely different place. So uh, so it, the, the idea was was just to take a step back in time, basically, and and. Uh, when I came on board after a few months of the restaurants being being created, it, it really felt like uh, hand into the glove fit, like we say in Swedish. Um, and um, I just started cooking straight away, of course. And it's mainly inspired and, and driven by uh, Scandinavian heritage style cooking. Uh, a lot of it is inspired flavors from Scandinavia. Uh, but of course, all the uh, produce is Australian. So it's a bit of a way of cooking Scandinavian style techniques with, with Australian produce as well. It's quite an in, uh, incredible uh, venue to walk into. I was fortunate enough to do that um, early on when it first opened. T- take us through the front doors and what it's like to experience the restaurant as a diner. So the, the venue is, is based in uh, in a basement on, on um, in Redfern uh, in an old, what used to be an old tobacco factory. So as you walk down the stairs, we have the the uh, front of a long ship facing out of the wall onto the onto the uh, guests. So as you walk down the light, if you look just up north, <laughs> straight up, you can see a big ship. And a lot of people actually tend to miss it because it is dimly lit down there. So it's a bit of a surprise for those who haven't seen it when we tell them we have a ship in the foyer. But uh, and as you come down, there's a big metal curtain with uh, a depiction of of Odin. Um, that can be seen like a little, little curtain, and then just straight to the left, we have, uh, of course, candlelight, but a big, a big uh, welcoming table where the host is is greeting the customers that are arriving. And slightly behind the um, uh, the desk, we have the open kitchen, which is where I work from all services. We're plating all the food, all the hot food, at least on the pass. So it's a bit of an interactive experience. A lot of people that are sitting in the main dining room section can see and interact with us if they so please in a bit of an open kitchen environment. But the, the actual kitchen is just behind it. Tell us a little bit about Scandinavian cuisine um, and and then what your representation of it is here. Well, I think to, to, um, to narrow it down, the Scandinavian uh, food culture is is very much inspired by years and years of cooking with seasons. Um, so it's been a way of making sure to preserve the bounty of summer to last through autumn 
and preserving again the autumn stuff that's still available to carry you through winter. So it's been a lot about pickling, fermenting, salting, curing, all the kind of stuff that allows you to to store and and uh, eat through the winter. Because traditionally, of course, especially in the north of Scandinavia, the the winters are very harsh, so nothing really grows. So it's a question of what you manage to stow away into your cellars that will carry you through the through the winter. And that's kind of a, a style of cooking that I, I really appreciate. Of course, being born and raised with it, you have a different appreciation for when things are actually in season. And asparagus will only taste as good as it does in the early months of the summer. And, and same with the strawberries. And they have a very special flavor and therefore a special place in our hearts. I think for a chef, it's like getting to get your grades to exactly when you want them because that's how your seasons are driven. You really have delicious and fantastic potatoes one time of the year and they are served almost as a dish by themselves. So for for a chef it's it's to me it's it came very natural to be driven by the produce driven food that it's very simple and kind of humble, peeled back. But also, you know, puts puts the the uh, focus on the chef really to to create out of the the uh, the humble ingredients, which is something that I quite like. What's it been like uh, using Australian ingredients that aren't necessarily available in in Scandinavia with this um, approach to cookery? Has it, has it changed the way that you construct dishes? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot, a lot of the stuff that we we have in Scandinavia is either not available in Australia or quite different here in Australia. Um, and same goes, of course, for a lot of the Australian produce. So that's been been quite an interesting journey of. of seeing sometimes Australian produce that remind you of something from back home. And it's pretty funny then to take take an, an idea of a dish from back home and, and translate it into Australian produce, um, often with a bit of a hint, a bit, a bit of a, I'm not sure what the expression would be, but a bit of a tongue-in-cheek play on, on those dishes. So, um, for instance, herring is one of those staples in Scandinavia that we have in abundance or had especially in abundance particularly in, in the uh, earlier years of the, of the century, but in hist- historically. And that's been one of those fishes that don't really, you can't really get in Australia, even though the herring is quite similar. There's a few fish that can translate all right to it, but I've been using kingfish because I think it's a fun product to, to play around with. And therefore, I've been trying to find ways of curing and pickling and without losing the integrity of the, of the quality of the product, product of course, because... Um, exposing fish to to white vinegar and salt and sugars uh, can be a traumatic if you're not being respectful. Uh, and I think that's been one of the fun things for me to take the Scandinavian heritage and translate it into both fine dining environments through the Mark restaurant. And take us back to uh, when you were young. You were born in Sweden. Um, what what was what role did food play in your family? And is there any sort of feasts that you remember you that you can share? Yeah, I mean, food food was extremely important for us in the family. I think that my my mother never really had the the um, that experience when she was growing up. So she really wanted to make sure to make it a bit of a tradition in our family. So we we had a very religious gathering around the dining table and and ate uh, delicious meals together. And especially for weekends, that would be consisting of often two and three courses. And and we would all be helping each other out to cook because that was it was more fun that way. And and you know, as soon as you had skills to do one thing, you started learning something else. And as soon as you started getting trusted in the kitchen, you could pretty much get away with anything. So we had a lot of fun cooking growing up, and and we still to this day, whenever we get get together, we end up cooking. I have three siblings, and they cook very quite quite a lot with their families as well. So it's been one of those family heritage things that's been passed on uh, in generations that I'm really grateful for. What lured you to uh, become a chef? I can only say that this that's the family. I thought it was a lot of fun to play around with flavors. I really enjoyed serving food to customers, to guests, to family, and and you know tweak recipes, get them better. It was just always something that came very natural to me. We had a, a big garden and through the, especially through the summer and autumn, we had a lot of bounty in the garden. It was red currants and apples and plums and all kinds of different gooseberries and 
all kinds of different vegetables and stuff that we were growing in the garden. So um, it was it was a pretty natural thing. I just fell in love with it basically, and I was cooking from from a very early age and continued to cook. But but because I wasn't really sure what I wanted to be when I was growing up or when I was an adult, <laughs> I was I was kind of you know persuaded is probably the wrong word encouraged i would say to to uh pursue other careers so i was studying engineering after my military service when i was uh lured into a kitchen uh and was cooking at a student organization it's a bit of a fraternity not american style but it's a bit similar we were um, members of this social club um and i was cooking first i was cooking once a week and then that was slowly and slowly becoming more and more frequent and after a jazz festival in 1999 i was uh cooking south american food with a sorry it's not south american american south <laughs> rather uh food with with a, for a jazz festival with this chef that came from washington and uh we hit it off straight away and i was cooking pretty much 24 7 for a week uh and i was completely blown away with how f much fun food can be and that's kind of when i decided that engineering wasn't uh, as much fun as cooking was you've worked at some pretty incredible restaurants in your career what's been the real important stepping stones for you um i think f for a long period of time growing growing up as a chef uh, and i mean growing up as a chef uh it was a question of, of, of seeking challenges. I've always been been intrigued by uh, people that push push the boundaries and, and create their own rule books. So so after after being trained in a kitchen and, and uh, starting cooking, I was always the one with the annoying questions that the other chefs couldn't answer. I was wondering why I had to put water in the water bath when you cooked a creme brulee because they couldn't really explain it. They just said you just have to. And that kind of reminded me of my math teacher when I was younger saying that this is the way you do it. It's like, well, that doesn't really satisfy my curious mind. So at an early stage, I was driven to find out more. And I ended up actually studying um, a bachelor in culinary arts. Uh, and that's when I came across. And that's when about the time that Heston Blumenthal was making uh, a name for himself over in England. And that's uh, how I ended up working for, for Heston Blumenthal in 2005 at the fat dock, um, learning how to prepare the uh, snail porridge and all the dishes that he became very famous for. Um, and I think that was a big eye opener to realize that there was many ways of uh, approaching cooking and not necessarily a right or a wrong way, but with, with physics in mind and, and a bit of a curious mind, you could, could be quite creative with food. And that's something that I've taken with me since then and, and always enjoyed in my, in my cooking career. You also spent some time at, per se, Thomas Keller's restaurant. Um, do you have any stories of that time? Yeah, absolutely. I said the, the first uh, time I really was struck by Thomas Keller's uh, qualities as a chef was when I was uh, recommended to get the French Laundry Cookbook as a friend of mine, as a chef, one of the first restaurants I worked in who, who spoke of him highly. And, and after seeing that cookbook, I was completely blown away with who he was as a chef and what that meant. And it wasn't really until later in life when I actually came across an opportunity to work for him. Uh, that was in 2009, uh, early 2009, I started working for Thomas Keller at Per Se. And he was, he's the executive chef for, for, for Per Se, where there was a, the local chef was Jonathan Benno. Um, and that was a very big brigade. Um, Pretty much, there was a lunch and dinner operation, but the chefs would start very early in the morning for the lunch shift. Um, it was an interesting experience, I have to say. Uh, it was very meticulously run. Um, Thomas Keller and, and Jonathan Benner both had family backgrounds in the military, so they were very... It was a military precision and um, character behind a lot of the things that were done there. Uh, a friend of mine who was... At the time, was a sous chef. He was referring to this. It's a bit of like joining a cult because it's a very strong culture in play, and uh, you do better to to be swept away by it, by it, basically. And I have to say that I learned a lot of of my from my 
over six months working at per se, but uh, I don't really know if the the culture agreed with me to the degree that it could have. I think that I would have been more malleable as a younger chef. Um, but it was a very fascinating experience. And to say that he's working with some of the world's best products is, of course, uh, very, very inspiring. And to see the organization behind it all has is, is made sure for me that my fridges are always very organized and clean and labeled and all that stuff that kind of is in, inevitable. If you work for Thomas Keller, you're always reaching for your green tape and your scissors and your Sharpies to make sure that everything is labeled. And, and it's really extremely helpful, of course, because it's one of those things you don't have to second guess where things are because you know where they are. You know they're in the right quality. And it's one of those fundamentals that stayed with me. Uh, it was a very fascinating experience. This episode is proudly supported by Open Table. Nearly one third of diners are booking same day. So they're making those decisions on the spot. And 10% are, are making their bookings within just a few hours. And so it's why it's so important to have you know, booking software like Open Table, which allows your diners to discover you. And so when restaurants are on platforms like Open Table, they're much more likely to be discovered. We help diners to connect to restaurants. Ultimately, having technology, using technology, helps you to reattach to those diners. Experience the power of Open Table. For an exclusive offer, visit restaurant.opentable.com.au forward slash DITW. Experience. What led to you coming down to Australia? It's funny. I have been trying to figure out why Australia was uh, in the cards for me so early on. But I think that when I was, um, I was actually back home in Sweden uh, last January and twenty twenty, early twenty twenty, and I was going through uh, one of the old um, boxes of relics that were put away in my mother's attic when I found five drawings with uh, haikus that we were, it was in a task we were given when I was probably 12 years old. And I had written five haikus and drawn five different themes, all with Australian uh, themes. And I had no idea why I did that. It was just one of those things that it just felt like a fascinating country far, far away with a lot of deadly animals and, and fat, fat with sharks and dingoes. And it was just one of those things. And I could have been through through some kind of uh, early childhood memories of, I don't really know what I've seen. I must have seen some kind of childhood. Maybe it's a documentary. It's about nature or something. But it was always in the cards for me. And I was always interested in coming down here. And I was talking so much about Australia that a lot of my friends beat me to it. So uh, I had friends who came down to to Brisbane and studied down in Brisbane because of my strong <laughs> strong desire to make it down to Australia. And unfortunately, I didn't make it down here while they were still here because they're back in Sweden now. But I ended up coming to Australia 2006 when I had finished up my uh, degree in culinary arts. It was time for an adventure, and I figured that was it was time to see Australia. So I came to Sydney in 2006, late in the year, it was October or something. Uh, when I stepped into Mark Restaurant and met uh, Mark Best, but also met Pasi Pettanen, who was the head chef at Mark at the time. And uh, his sous chef, sous chef was named Reuven, who was a German chef as well. So I stepped in and I felt at home straight away. Uh, I was only supposed to be in Sydney for about over the summer was the plan for three months at least, but I ended up staying for six months um, and really quite enjoyed cooking. Uh, in Australia, but also cooking with Best and, and uh, the guys in the kitchen. Why did you feel like you were at home in that kitchen with Passy and Mark? I think between between uh, Mark's dark sense of humor, we, we had a very good connection straight away, me and Mark. It was just one of those um, situations when you meet somebody, you know that you've either known them for a very long time already or you're going to know them for a very long time moving forward. So it was just one of those uh, meetings that you felt had a, had a true significance. Uh, but of course, Pasi being Finnish, uh, our cooking history isn't that dissimilar. And he was uh, had been working a fair bit in London as well. So we had both fine dining background and training, and we had the Scandinavian heritage in the background. So it just felt natural uh, straight away to cook. Uh, we had similar ideas and uh, approaches to things. And when people would scratch their heads and wondering where the ideas came from, I could see the red line going through it all and just really understood it. It's a bit like a musician and you can get into a song by hearing what the other instruments are playing and you just know what to do. It's just, it just Everything just fell into place, basically. 
It was uh, Mark was one of Australia's most influential restaurants for over a decade, um, with a tiny little kitchen and incredible alumni. What, what did you take out of the experience there? I, I so many things. I mean, I cooked. For, I I was at Mark in two thousand and six, and then I came back in two thousand and nine after my stint at Per Se, and stayed at Mark Restaurant for five years. So I was there until two thousand and fourteen. Uh, and that was the head chef uh, when Posse left. So I was sous chef and then was head chef. So I've taken a tremendous amount of, of uh, experiences from that time um, and a lot of connections as well. Like you said, there's an incredible alumni uh, from, from Mark Restaurant. You're also involved with uh, Pay Modern, which was um, Mark Best was at the helm of. Uh, tell us about that experience and how different that was compared to Mark. I think the the uh, the product Pay Modern I uh, had a lot of faith and, and respect for. I really loved cooking with with that uh, under under the brand of Pay Modern, and I think that it was uh, a great product. I really enjoyed cooking. Uh, what was a bit more of a bistro version of uh, Mark Restaurant uh, would be, but being fitted inside the Four Seasons, of course, had its own expectations for the customers, and I feel that. Uh, a great product that I was very proud and, and excited to work with, um, but perhaps nothing something that the the Four Seasons diners weren't really understanding of. But we had some great times. I was really happy. I was there for I think it was two years at at uh, the Four Seasons. Tell us about uh, Mjolnir. How did you uh, get the job at first, and um, how much of it changed after you got a hold of the keys to the kitchen? Um, I would say that the, the it was I uh, through my time at the Four Seasons I, I um, got to know uh, Alexander Dahlenberg who was the uh, venue manager at the time uh, when I joined Mjolnir and we were working together at the Four Seasons so when I knew that or heard that she was getting involved with a Viking restaurant I keep kept hinting at her wondering when she was going to hire a real Viking chef uh, but it wasn't until the restaurant that I was then working at, Bush, uh, failed in October. I think it was 2016, 17, 17. It was 7, 2017. Uh, that's when I joined uh, the ranks at Mjolnir. And I met Sven for the first time at a cafe just around the corner from, from Mjolnir. And I sat down and he saw that I have a Mjolnir tattooed on my hand and basically said, well, you're wearing the brand already tell me what you need from me for you to join the team. So we had a pretty funny first connection, and we had a great connection from the first go as well uh, when I met Sven. And we were just talking about, you know, what the restaurant was hoping to achieve and what it was about. And and I feel like I took that concept and ran with it um, because the, the format was there, the, the, the pillars were there, and it was just a question of filling that canvas with paint. And, and having this Scandinavian background that I do, it's always been natural for me. And it's both been a fun way of taking humble products to new levels, uh, using Mjolnir as a brand now instead. So it's, it's, it's kind of, it, it's, there's, a, there's a sense behind it all, which is kind of fun to see that my Scandinavian background has gone full circle from being really in, back in the early tw- 2010s when Noma first came on the big scene and everybody was talking about Scandinavian and, Scandinavian cooking, and it was just fun to be a part of that, and that, that revolution that kind of swept through. And now to see it, and, and it's back towards its own original form, is, is, is really fun. So I'm having a lot of fun cooking at Mjolnir, and uh, I'm very proud of what we created. Well, tell us a bit about a Viking feast, or your interpretation of it. Is there a dish or two that you can tell us about that kind of really um, epitomizes what you're doing as a chef? I feel like uh, what makes Mjolnir special uh, is is a bit of a, there is a bit of theater behind it, of course. And like you said in the early introduction is that themed restaurants is one of those things that are a bit misunderstood and it's something that hasn't been particularly common uh, in in modern days. There's been more of those back in the 70s or 80s, perhaps. But I say it in New York, they're alive and well. And I have seen so many themed restaurants do very well because you're allowed to be a little bit different. You don't have to play by the same rule book that everybody else does. So I think that the the atmosphere in, in the restaurant and the simplicity, but also brutality behind the dishes is one of those things that comes together in a perfect symbiosis. Um, 
I like to cook a lot of game, a uh, bit of a hunter gather vibe on, on a lot of the dishes that we're doing. But we also want to keep keep people comfortable and not be too too provoking provocative. But there's there's room for both. So there's comfort and there's a bit more provocative style of cooking. So I have this dish that's a braised venison shank that we source out of South Australia that's a wild shot uh, that I'm really proud to use because, of course, it's an introduced species and a bit of a pest. So we like to try to use those products to 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 shift focus from the the normal meat industry and do something a little bit different. Uh, and it's braised, and then we use the bracing liquids and uh, make a, a beetroot sauce. So the, the shank, it's served with a, with a beetroot glaze that kind of looks a bit like a blood and bones pile, really. Um, so I like to be a little bit dramatic with the visuals. Uh, and I think that's one of those things that's kind of, there's an ethos behind it, but there's also, of course, people, especially in Australia, are quite fond of beetroot. So it's a way of making people comfortable, but a bit sim- at the same time being a bit provocative. Another dish that we're really quite well known for is the roast bone marrow, which is a split femur bone from a cow that we roast and blow torch and serve with different garnishes depending on what year it is really we have been using fermented mushrooms uh for a while now uh, and we'll be doing so when we reopen as well which is just around the corner um and it's just mushrooms it's mushrooms and toast really but with a split femur bone and then we have fermented mushrooms and there's a roast mushroom powder and so i like to take techniques and, and put them back into simplicity so you get a lot of flavor and perhaps not really sure why things are so tasty as they are, but there's a few little chef's trick up the sleeve that you can make use of. You mentioned that you went uh, back to Sweden at the beginning of 2020, um, just before the whole world experienced this pandemic. What, what sort of impact has the last sort of year and a half had on you? It's been an interesting experience uh, to be pushed away from your craft in the way that I feel that I was when restaurants were forced to close. Um, of course, having cooked professionally for over 20 years and always going from, from job to job, which I have been, in the few times that I've been unemployed, it's usually been in between, in between jobs has been a pretty short experience. So being forced to kind of sit back and f- think about what you're doing and how you're doing it and how you'd like to do things differently when you reopen has been a bit of a blessing, but also a bit of a frustration, I have to say. Of course, the unknown it's difficult. And again, now with this current lockdown that's been lasted over three months, uh, it's been, again, a bit of a welcome break, perhaps, because the the, uh, the months that we were open in between were pretty chaotic and, and a bit understaffed. But it's it's a, it's been an interesting experience to kind of step back from your craft, think about what you're doing and what you like to achieve with your next coming years professionally and where you hope to see yourself in the future. What sort of impact did that have on you? Will will you be approaching your craft differently as a result of what's happened? I, I think that, if anything, my, my beliefs have been uh, enhanced, restored. I think that I owe it to myself to push myself creatively, but also kind of have a meaning behind the things that I'm doing. Um, chefs always make a big um effort when they choose produce and and kind of put that ethos back into what i'm cooking and how i'm cooking it uh will definitely be a big part of what i'm doing moving forward to choose sustainable proteins and even be inspired by i have a friend in copenhagen who runs a famous restaurant called amass and uh his name is matt matt, matt orlando and he was before he opened amass he was the head chef at noma and he's been a good friend from my from my years together at, at the fat duck and they have have taken the carbon neutral footprint thing to a whole new level and uh, have banned all cling wrap in the kitchen and they're very con- conscious about their their carbon footprint and as much as it's a big thing in a, in, in Scandinavia it's something that I think that we can learn to glimpse at when it comes to here to be being here like I when I first joined the restaurant we were cooking uh, a ton of shore ribs per month uh, and that's not exaggerating. That's that's actual numbers. It was, it was a ton of short ribs every month going through that kitchen, and I felt that that as 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 happy as I was for the customers, as soon as the beef prices started getting affected by COVID and all the things that were going, even before when the droughts were hitting Australia, it was just one of those things that was exponentially putting us in trouble financially because it was such an expensive product, and people weren't really willing to pay what it actually cost. So I've been having a lot of fun looking at alternative produce, pro, uh, proteins for different reasons. So 
anything from wild rabbits to venison to to you name it, basically, to have a little look at spreading people's preferences out from what they think they just want a steak on the plate to to leave the dining room talking about how delicious the bro- uh, the broccoli was and not understanding why it's so delicious. And I'm happy to tell them that it's a bit of Vietnamese fish sauce uh, on the deep fried Brussels sprouts. So deep fried broccoli, when it comes out of the fryer, makes for a massive umami explosion, but also a bit of a flavor that resonates from home with salted fish. So it's, yeah, I think that that will just, I'm, I, more, if anything else, I'm just encouraged to be to be more, a bit, bit bolder perhaps, a bit less comforting and more more uh, not necessarily provocative but you know I, there's there's more to pull out of this book of rhymes and i feel like it's time to to challenge myself as well as the customers you've worked at some amazing restaurants all over the globe and now one of the most influential chefs in sydney with a really in a really busy restaurant what what, what is it that you love about what you do uh, i have to say this this is the energy of, of it all, it's, it's, it's such a moving machinery. When you're standing on the pass on a Saturday night and we're doing anywhere up to close around 100, 180 covers, um, it's, it's a pretty good uh, energetic place to be and you're surfing on this high of a, of a successful service. And it's, it's so funny because the things that were, were inspiring and exciting to me when I was a young chef has of course uh, changed over the years, and I feel like the connection I have today with my my uh, staff and all the customers that are there experiencing our product is really what keeps me motivated and keeps me going, doing what I'm doing. The cooking in itself is of course rewarding, but it's it's really the experience when people get to eat the food and talk about the food and see the food for the first time is really that that's really what's my biggest reward, and that's also of course what's been desperately missing for the last two years at stages, uh, especially the last few months. There's a bit of light at the end of the tunnel with uh, New South Wales announcing a roadmap to opening up restaurants again. How are you feeling about that and and what are you looking forward to? Uh, I am extremely excited to be getting the band back together um, and to to get back into it um, and to get customers through the door, uh, basically, and to be able to give them that special experience, showing them what Mjolnir is about, and also getting people to sort of leave the outworld problems behind them and just step back in time. We have, uh, for the past, since early 2000, we changed. We used to be uh, playing uh, a lot of 90s rap in the dining room because we felt like that was a fun contrast to what we were actually doing. But uh, over time, we felt like it was probably about time that we took a step back with the music as well. And we've been playing a lot of Norse-inspired music in the last uh, year and a half, and it's made a massive impact on the theatrical experience of the restaurant. Uh, So it's very breathy and drummy, and there's a few bands that do really, really great Scandinavian-inspired music. Uh, One band is called Vardruna, for instance. And they're they're as, as... really quite fascinating to to see what that actually does to the product so we're we're not ashamed of being different we we think it's fantastic when i first came on board at a restaurant my my one of my goals was to be able to get a, a chef's hat and see that the food is of course up to scratch for the quality of of that experience but i think that we've still been eluded by the the guides uh, but i have to say that the 7 to 800 customers that find their way through our door every week uh, are Speaking volume. So even if none of those are reviewers, we seem to be doing rather well. And I'm very excited about the fact that we are. And the people that come back are very, very excited to, to come through. We have some absolute diehard fans who have been eating in the restaurants close to 20 times and comes comes back with different friends all the time. And they're excited. So oh, my, my birthday is finally coming up. We're coming in with a big group. And they reach out. And it's pretty funny because we have some diehard fans in the restaurant. And it's really nice to see. And it's... Kind of what keeps you motivated as well to to make sure that you deliver that expectation and above above and beyond it. It's like Thomas Keller was saying that when it comes to cooking in the kitchen, it's like I don't really care about the the reviewer on table fourteen. Like I want to impress the guys on larder, and if I can cook food that blows their mind, I know for a fact that I'm going to manage to blow the mind out of the reviewers because we know food better than they do, uh, and we work with it in a different way. So he's just like, don't worry about that part. Just make sure that the product makes sense to you and, and get the 
the engine running and and it'll it'll all just fall into place and i feel like that's what it's done it's gone from clarity to clarity from when we first opened and, and grown from strength to strength uh, as well so well you know kim we've loved having you on deep in the weeds today to hear your story and very much looking forward to you opening the doors and welcoming back those 800 people a week into the restaurant uh, please keep in touch and uh, we'll talk again soon fantastic thank you very much have a great day This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.